So, welcome to your first session of the Cell Biology Practical Course. My name is Mariana Araujo. As you might have noticed by now, this practical course will be held in English. So please, if you have the feeling that my pace is too fast or there is something you don't understand, don't hesitate to use the chat function, okay? So, my task is to give you an introduction to this practical course. Before we go deep into it, let me take you on a small journey. Let's pretend that we are at the bench and we are about to start an experiment. And every good experiment starts with a good plan. So in order to plan an experiment, you have to take into consideration A, what is the question that you would like to address? B, what is the model system? So which cell lines you are going to use or uh, animal models or whatever. And as a third topic, you need to take into consideration the methods. What would be the adequate method to answer the question? This same approach in terms of planning that I've just introduced to you has been used for us in order to set up this practical course. So our first objective was to define what would we like to transmit to you? And we have decided on a so-called package of methods. This is supposed to be a toolbox, a combination of basic methods that will accompany you for the rest of your scientific career. And you will, ever so often, come back to this pool of methods and use them to answer specific questions. So, in your let's say, preliminary tool pack of methods, we have, in first instance, cell culture. And cell culture is extremely important for us because as cell biologists, we use normally cells as tools to address our questions. And uh, cell culture and the methods related to cell culture will be introduced to you by Ilya. The cell culture procedures are then linked to a transient transfection in which we will introduce in cells DNA in order to express, overexpress a protein of interest. And then we can use this protein of interest to, be able to visualize, for example, where it is located within the cell. And this leads us then to the next method, which would be an immunofluorescence. So these first three methods, all of them, will be introduced to you by Ilya. Um, as I've mentioned, one can use immunofluorescence to detect, for example, the presence of a protein A in a particular subcellular location. But there are other ways how you can address the same question. For example, if you use a subcellular fractionation, which is a biochemical method, you can enrich for a specific organelle and look if this given protein A is located at the mitochondria or on lysosomes. And attached, or as a consequence of a subcellular fractionation, we also would like to introduce to you one of the basic methods used in the analysis of proteins, and that is an SDS page, which allows us to separate and observe the proteins that are present in a given fraction, in a given sample. And this is also visualized by a Western blotting, in which you will observe the presence of your specific protein of interest in one or the other fraction. Subcellular fractionation, SDS page and western blotting will be introduced to you by Taras. And finally, you will see me back again here in the last day to introduce you to certain cell biology and viability and proliferation assays. Now, this is the working package that we have assigned to you. And as I've mentioned before, we will need not only an overview of the methods, but also to define which tools will we use, which cell line. And that brings me to the next slide. So what you see here is a table in which highlighted are commonly used cell lines in uh, every cell culture lab, lab that uses cell culture. All of them are immortalized cell lines, cell lines, meaning that they are capable of indefinite replication in culture, and they are all actually very different. As an example, if you start in the beginning of this table, we have 3T3. These are the so-called NIH 3T3 
fibroblasts, mouse fibroblasts, that have been initially the, characterized by the establishment of the so-called 3T3 protocol. So the basic protocol defining that cells should be stripped split every third day at a concentration of 3 times 10 to the fifth cells. These cells are also important historically because, and also in practical terms now, because they have allowed us to grow, because we use them as feeders, both keratinocytes and human stem cells. Um, you also see on this list another example uh, would be MDCK cells. MDCK cells are dog-derived cells, epithelial cells, that are used in polarity studies and also, for example, in the establishment of 3D cultures of cells. Um, the list contains other cell lines, for example, PC12, we have, which have a characteristic neuronal-like phenotype, or, for example, HEC293 or 293 cells that are very easy to transfect and are therefore one of the most used cell lines in the biotechnological field. So, we have a list of cell lines. So, the next thing we needed to establish are the criteria of choice. So, what should be the selection criteria for us to choose a cell line? We would like to use a human cell line. We would like it to be robust. This is going to be the first cell line you have in your hands. Then it should be something that is easy to transfect because you will do a transient transfection. It should be as flat as possible because you will do immunofluorescences. And finally, it should be fast growing. For your subcellular fractionation experiments, you will need a lot of material. And therefore, it is easier for us if it, this would be a um, fast growing cell line. And taking into consideration all of these criteria, we came up with a choice of HeLa cells. So HeLa cells have been derived in 1951 from a biopsy of Henrietta Lacks a cervical adenocarcinoma that was collected without her informed consent. Henrietta died on the same year and she was age 31. It took two decades until there was a clear statement of the origin of the HeLa cells. So, in 71, the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology identified Henrietta Lacks as the donor of the HeLa cells. And another two decades had to pass until her family, so the Lacks family, learned about the HeLa cells, so the biopsy that had been taken from her mother. And this occurred because uh, scientists have started a blood collection from all the family members in order to map the HeLa genes. So, and this was again performed without informed consent. 2013 is a big <laughs> year. It, first of all, because uh, scientists were able to decipher the HeLa genome that was published without knowledge of the family. But on the same year and for the first time, the family has been involved in the changes and they have endorsed restricted access to the HeLa genome data. Important is also for, for me to let you know that this also revealed to us scientists working with HeLa cells for many years that HeLa are actually very different than, let's say, a prototype human cell. In fact, the HeLa genome is considerably different from the reference uh, that has been acquired during the hum Human Genome Project. So they are not, um, um, they are a uh, a cancer cell line and that is visible also in their in its genomic profile. Having said that, healers have been a major uh, gift to mankind and they have allowed many discoveries for which we are very thankful to Henrietta Lass. I think the most critical uh, development of all has been in the 1950s, the um, development in the polio vaccine, the establishment of the first suitable poliomyelitis vaccine. And this has been follows, followed in the 80s, both of our, by the identification of the human papilloma virus, leading to the human papilloma virus vaccine, but also on the identification and the studies on HIV and AIDS that lead to the current uh, therapeutical approaches in this area. 
since Hila has been the first cell line to be cultivated, it also paved the way to the establishment of the protocols for correct and suitable um, cell culture performance within the labs. And as a side effect, it has contributed to the establishment of the karyotyping procedure, so the identification of the number of chromosomes that is present within each cell line. Um, you can see from these lists that the list is really, really long. And it includes phenomena, for example, in the area of cell cycle control, uh, protein transport within cells, and also telomerase. All of these being linked to um, Nobel Prize uh, winners and Nobel Prize laureates. So, having discussed about HeLa, we then would like to introduce you to a biological question. What would we like to study and why? As cell biologists, one of the fundamental questions we would like to address is what defines the faith of a cell? Should a cell divide? Should it survive? Simply stay. Differentiate into a new type of cell or die? And in order to combine this biological question with the methods that I have introduced to you, we've decided that the easiest way would be to add a tool. In this case, two inhibitors, Velcade and Taxol, that are used in a clinical setting. In the next few slides, I would like to introduce a bit the background, the biological background that helps you, uh, helps you understand what these drugs actually do. And I would start by introducing to you the ubiquitin proteasomal pathway. This is a very important pathway that controls protein catabolism both in the cytosol and in the nucleus. And you see, this pathway starts with a small, highly abundant protein, uh, ubiquitous, it, that is called ubiquitin. Ubiquitin can be activated by a so-called E1, in a process that requires ATP. Activated ubiquitin can then be, um, can then be translocated uh, into a knee tube, trans, trans, um, transported into a knee tube, transferred, in, transferred is the right word, transferred into a knee tube, and this e, into the cysteine of the E2, and it's then this um, E2 that is then responsible via the action of an E3 ligase to bring the ubiquitin into the lysine of the substrate. And the attachment uh, to, of a ubiquitin to uh, a lysine on the substrate is then used upon multiple steps as a recognition by the proteasome. Actually, the proteasome requires the attachment of at least four moieties of ubiquitin in this so-called lysine K48 linked polyubiquitin chains. And this moiety is then the minimal setup that is necessary for uh, proteasomal recognition. At the proteasome, the substrate is degraded and the ubiquitin is recycled back to new rounds of ubiquitination for other proteins, for example. Coming back, to the structure of the proteasome and of the proteasome per se. Uh, the proteasome is a barrel-shaped cylinder with a central proteolytic core. So the degradation capacity occurs in the center of the proteasome. And the 20S proteasome is composed of four rings stacked on each other that are flanked at one end or the other by the so-called uh, 19S. These are regulatory uh, domains that are required for the recognition of the substrate. Uh, so they recognize the ubiquitinated substrate and only ubiquitinated substrate and are necessary to correctly target the, uh, the substrate towards the um, towards the central core, so to allow translocation and degradation of the substrate protein, while at the same time releasing the ubiquitin for further rounds. And now that I've introduced you a little bit to the structure of the proteasome and the importance of the proteasome as a main catabolic station within the cell, I would like to tell you that the capacity of the proteasome, so the, the 
proteasome per se, is actually kept in balance but also by the proteasomal load. So in physiological terms, uh, cells establish a balance between how many proteins you need to degrade via the proteasome and how many proteasomes are actually available to perform the task. And this uh, equilibrium between both uh, is uh, mediated by several functions that include, for example, the targeting and the control of the protein synthesis rate. Also, for example, the rate of chaperone activity, because if the chaperone activity is reduced, then it will have a lot of misfolded proteins. And this will, of course, be targeted, uh, targeting proteins for the proteasome and the increased proteasomal load, but we also have other functions, f factors like, for example, uh, deubiquitinating enzymes. The function of the deubiquitinating enzymes interferes with proteasomal load. And on the other side of this balance, shown here, we see that the proteasomal capacity is actually um, um, a consequence of, for example, the rate of proteasomal subunitis synthesis and also proteasomal assembly. That means we keep the balance by regulating many, many factors. And scientists have recognized that if, for example, one gives a proteasome inhibitor into the system, we shift the balance. So we are reducing the proteasome capacity and at the same time increasing the proteasomal load. And it's actually the accumulation of all of these proteins that should be degraded, but are not, that then triggers apoptosis within the cells. Now, exactly for these reasons, scientists have recognized that the inhibitors of the proteasome could potentially be good, good tools to increase apoptosis in a tumor setting, so increase apoptosis in tumors. And what you see here on the left-hand side is a table of selected inhibitors of the 20S proteasome that are used in a clinical setting. On the top of this list, we have bortezomib of, or Velcade. This is the inhibitor that you will use in the practical course. And bortezomib is targeting the beta-5, beta-1, and beta-2. Here, on the right-hand side, you see what that exactly means. It means that uh, bortezomib of Belkit blocks both the chemotriptic-like, the caspase-like, and the triptych-like activity of the proteasome. So it blocks all three of them, even though it has a higher blockage or a higher propensity to, propensity to block the chemotriptic function. It is a reversible inhibitor, stated here on the table, and you can see that it's used for the treatment of both multiple myeloma and uh, mantle cell lymphoma, and also the refractory versions of these diseases, so when the tumors progress. It is linked to a number of adverse side effects that include, for example, vomiting and diarrhea and uh, infections. And therefore, because of its restricted use being used only in a subset of tumors and the presence of adverse side effects, scientists have tried to optimize and develop new 20S proteasomal inhibitors. One of these newest forms is, for example, marizomib, which is found in the bottom of this table, and morizubit is on one hand irreversible, meaning it stays, you cannot wash it away or, or remove it from the proteasome, and it targets with the same strength all of the activities in the proteasome, beta 5, beta 2, and beta 1. This is just to tell you that there are new developments, and because we will be using bortezomib in this course, I would like to take a few minutes to show you how Velcade or bortezomib actually contributes to cell death in the setting of multiple myeloma. So, in the center of this picture, you see here the proteasome being blocked by the bortezomib or Velcade. As a consequence, you have an accumulation of misfolded proteins. And it's this misfolded proteins that will then turn on the unfolded protein response pathway. This unfolded pro protein response pathway will then trigger apoptosis. The induction of apoptosis is then strengthened by the fact 
that you have a simultaneously accumulation of other proteins, not just the misfolded ones, but also, for example, proteins that have a short half-life. Short half-life means that proteins need to be synthesized and degraded in a constitutive and fast rate. So, for example, some of the short half-life proteins are those that are involved in cell cycle regulation. P21 and P27 are two of the proteins that get accumulated due to the fact that we block the proteasome, and they also lead to a disruption, disruption of the cell cycle progression with concomitant increase in apoptosis. And there are also other proteins that increase the apoptosis rate, uh, for example, P53, from which you already heard a lot, but it the blockage of the proteasome increases P53 levels, and it also increases, for example, the levels of NOXA, both of them leading to an increase in apoptosis. So, in many ways, the inhibition of the proteasome leads to the accumulation of proteins that then triggers, <coughs> through several cascades, the increase in apoptosis. Now, um, because the targeting of the proteasome is just the final step in this cascade, and as you've seen, people have tried to devote, scientists have tried to devote quite a lot of attention to interfering with the proteasomal function, they also uncovered that it could be possible to target this ubiquitin proteasomal pathway at different stages in the process, and therefore try to avoid some of the side effects that have been seen before in the treatment of patients in the clinics. One of the ideas is, for example, the targeting of E3s, the E3 ligage that is necessary to conjugate the ubiquitin to the lysine in the substrate. And just here is an example, SCF E3 ligases. This is the Coolin E3s family of E3 ligases. This is the broadest family of all, and it includes um, proteins, so E3s, that are involved in the regulation on one hand of cell cycle proteins, but also in proteins regulating uh, DNA replication. So these are, for example, good candidates for the use in a clinical setting. So I hope with this to give you a bit of an introduction of how Velcid function and what we are targeting in this system, so targeting the ubiquitin proteosomal system. And I would like in the next few slides to switch gears and introduce you to the second of our drug targets, and that is Taxol. And I cannot start talking about Taxol without bringing you back to microtubules. You've heard of microtubules before. Microtubules are fundamental for uh, maintaining the um, stability of proteins and the, the structure of the cell. Uh, sorry, this, uh, the stability and the structure of the cell in general, they are polymers of beta and alpha tubulin. And these uh, dimers of alpha and beta tubulin uh, assemble in so-called protofilaments, these linear structures that are shown in here. And it's the assembly of this protofilament then in a larger structure, in these cylinder-like structures with lumen, that we then call microtubules. And uh, microtubules play many critical roles. One of them is represented here. They are involved in polarity and also in intracellular transport. So if you consider the microtubules in a, let's call it, interface cell, they are emanating from the centrosome that is located perinuclearly. And these microtubules are used in order to transport vesicles along the microtubules either towards the cell periphery or towards the center of the cells, toward the perinuclear region. Uh, the assignment, so the distinction between one or the other direction of movement, is dependent on which uh, motor proteins the vesicles are bound to, either thionin or kinasin-based motor proteins. Either way, as you can see in this picture, microtubules are important for intracellular transport. But they are not only important during the, let's say, um, uh, in non-dividing cells, but they are also important during the cellular division. And this is very well known. You have seen a picture like this before. It's on the right hand of this slide. 
This is a so-called uh, mitotic spindle apparatus in which you can see that we have two centrosomes from which microtubules emanate, being them the astral microtubules or kinetochore attached microtubules or interpolar microtubules. And it's the correct establishment of this um, uh, structure that is uh, achieved by the reorganization of the microtubules uh, that is required for the correct segregation of the sister uh, chromatids, so of the daughter chromosomes between the two uh, daughter cell lines. And it is critical for the maintenance of the, um, um, of the integrity of the cells during divisions. So maintaining uh, the genotype of the cells. Now, exactly because of its role during the cell cycle division, uh, microtubule targeting drugs have been used and are used in a clinical setting. You see here in this table, in the bottom part of it, uh, a number of microtubule-specific drugs that includes Taxil, that we will be discussing here, but also other drugs like, for example, colchicine, vimblastine, and nocodazole. Colchicine is... As a short example, uh, used for the treatment of gout. If you remember, this is this disease where you see an accumulation of uric acid in, in the joints, and this causes inflammation and quite a considerable amount of joint pain. So you see a clinical application of a microtubule-specific drug, but also Taxol. Taxol that binds and stabilizes microtubules is used in the clinics. And I would like to, in the next couple of slides, to introduce you how Taxol actually does that. So Taxol, or Paclitaxel, actually binds to the lumen of microtubules, as you see in the picture here. These are these red structures in the hollow middle of the microtubule tube. And microtubules need this dynamic cycle between polymerization and depolymerization in order to perform their functions. In many ways, the presence of this GTP cap here allows microtubule polymerization and prevents the depolymerization until you arrive and the cap is disassembled. And it is this disassembling of the cap in many ways that is prevented by uh, taxol or paclitaxel, and this uh, this leads to um, reduction of the of the um, uh, depolymerization rate. And because microtubules get always in the polymerized form, we prevent the this equilibrium between polymerization and depolymerization rates and affecting microtubule function. So. Antimitotic drugs and Taxol can be seen as an antimitotic drug because as I've introduced to you, you need microtubules in the establishment of the uh, spindle apparatus. Um, this uh, establishment of the spindle apparatus and the abolishment of the microtubule assembly and disassembly cycles uh, needs to a mitotic arrest. This mitotic arrest is then recognized by the spindle checkpoint. And in many ways, shown here, the consequences of this mitotic arrest can be manifold. So you can solve this status by directly shifting so, uh, cells sorry, into death in mitosis. Cells can also go and slip into an exit without division, means that they become polyploid. Or you can also have an unequal division with, as a consequence, an increase in aneuploidy. In either way, what you see as downstream effects of taxol treatment is an increase in cell death. And this increase in cell death is also seen and used as a treatment, uh, for example, in breast cancer, in ovarian cancer, in non-small cell lung cancer, in pancreatic cancer, and for example, for Kaposi sarcoma linked to AIDS. Now, if you use Taxol at concentrations that are somewhat equivalent to those seen in the treatment of the patients, we often see that uh, Taxol or Barclitaxel 
doesn't lead to a mitotic arrest, but is often associated with multipolar spindles that are able to slip over, uh, spill over, so, so they pass through the mitotic uh, stages and can not be arrested. And what you see is the formation of anaphases in which the chromosomes are segregated into multiple directions as a consequence of these multiple polar spindles. And these uh, unusual anaphase-like structures are linked then to a partial cytokinesis failure and considerable levels of aneuploidy with concomitant increase in apoptosis. So either way, independent of the levels at which you use Taxol, what we see is mitotic arrest or a slippage through with strange uh, anaphase um, structures that we actually end up with increased cell death. Having said that and introduced you to both inhibitors, I would like in the last few minutes to bring you to an example from the lab. So what could I somehow use as an example of these two inhibitors? I would like one hand to give you a feeling of the cells in the cultivation system and how they look like when they are treated. And do this in such a way that you can see the effect of those drugs in a time-dependent manner, so over time. For this particular purpose, I have used the cell line of choice, so the HeLa cells that we have discussed before, and I, ha and I have transfected them with m cherry H2P. So they are expressing a red fluorescent form of H2P. And H2P, or histone H2P, just as a reminder, is one of the core histones on the nucleosome in which the DNA wraps around. So what you see here in the picture on the bottom is an image of these HeLa cells in culture. And you see that they have different levels of this m cherry h 2 b Some have hardly any, some have a little bit of the tagged version of the histone, and some have a lot of it. Important for you is also, and I hope that you can appreciate that, that we see different shapes of the cells. There are cells which are quite broadly flat, they are nicely sitting down, on the dish. There are some which uh, have a very cleading, you see here this, these accumulations in the front of the cell. This is a so-called leading edge, so the cell is moving in this direction, and it has a rear edge. This is the back of the cell, so to say. And you see that it has a very clear moving morphology. And you also see that there are other cells, for example this one over here that is round up, or these two on the right hand top side. So, cells can assume multiple shapes. Why is that? One of the reasons behind it is that there is an intrinsic relationship between the cytoskeleton and the cell cycle. So, in order for the cells to divide, as you have seen, they need to round up. And this um, rounding up to uh, establish the mitotic spindle is then uh, dependent on a regulation of the cytoskeleton. So cells need to round up, then perform cytokinesis, and then come back to a kind of adhesion complex formation, possibly migrating form. And because of this, a lot of the cytoskeleton controllers, like Rho GTPases, GTP uh, regulators, like the RAC proteins, actin regulators, and so on, they are all actively controlled during the cell cycle. And this is just to give you as a reminder that we then might have situations in which the cells have round up in order to divide. And having, you, having given, given you as a hint, I hope that now we can spend the next few minutes analyzing a little bit what happens then if we look at cells under the microscope and observe all of these different shapes and forms. So, I needed, like I mentioned before, to establish also the method. And the cultivation method in this case has been the incocyte system. You will be using the incocyte also in other practical courses, not in, only in ours. And I would just like to give you a very short introduction. So basically what we have is uh, here you see a kind of a, a, a table that is introduced into a machine that contains on the bottom the objectives. So in many ways, it's like putting a microscope 
inside of your incubator. So this little chamber has the objectives on the bottom and it can move the objectives to either analyze big flasks or small plates at any given time during the procedure and you can obtain a picture without having to open the entire system that you can control both by this machine on the top but also via your own computer. So I placed in this machine a 24 well plate and I have set up an experiment which as you can see here I labeled as in the end of April as Mole Mad Practical Course. This is your experiment and you can see on the right hand side this is a, a view from my own computer that I can identify in each one of the wells the position of each one of the four movies in each well that I have assigned should be taken and also the position of each one of the wells with respective treatments. And during the acquisition time that I set to be taking place every half an hour for two days, we can always go back, I could always go back and cross check what kind of images the system is acquiring. You see here an overview in which the images have been taken at a given time. I don't, I don't remember exactly now what time frame it, it, this has been, but you get an overview of all of them. And you can also zoom in and say, for example, in the well labeled as B6, B position 6, you can see the cells and you can have an overview if the system is working or not. Now, having introduced you to how I acquired this, um, this data set and also with a bit of an explanation how Velcade and Taxel works, I would like to now show you what happens if you look at the at these videos in detail. This is an example of cells and the proliferation. So I will start the video now and I hope that you will see that these cells here on the top that have quite a lot of histone, red histone, they are dividing. They round it up, they divide, they round up, they divide and then they flatten out again to continue the next interface. And you see here one in the top, this cell, it was initially intending to move in this direction and you see that it has now decided to divide, it rounded up, telophase and we have cytokinesis and we have two daughter cells. So these are examples of how you see in a movie the presence of a cell division. And in the same way, just as an example, you can see here how in a movie you can recognize apoptosis. So, Take into consideration here, you see cells that have been bled and they have died. Oh, let me start from the beginning, this has been too fast. Let's focus on this upper one first. You see, easily the cell bleps, divides, and you see an apoptotic cell. And the same thing occurs in that cell and this one flattened on the bottom. Let's play it again. So this is the cell we're focusing on. So take a close look at it. You see the cell shrinks. It retracts. And you form blebbing and you have an apoptotic cell. So after giving you those two examples, I, ho I hope you got a bit of a feeling of what you can expect to see when you see cells really heavily dying and when the cells are actively dividing. And with that, I would like to introduce you to your homework. So what would you be like you to do once you've learned now what Velcade and Taxel do? Well, we see here three images, A, B and C which corresponds to three movies. Movie number one, two and three. In this setup we have one movie of untreated cells, one movie of cells treated with Velcade and one movie of cells treated with Taxol. And the intention is for you to tell me which is which. So let's start from the beginning. I will shortly play video number one, so A. Let's go through it.
Is the message clear? I hope so, but we can play that back once you see the other ones if you need time for a comparison. So, okay, this was video A. Now I'll play video B. Do you recognize that the cells have round up before they actually go into death? Let's see. I'll play this video again just to demonstrate what I was referring to. First you see a large number of cells rounding up. This is the stage I'm referring to. They're all basically rounding up. And then you start to see increased cell death. Okay, good. We are left with video number three or C. Take a look at the situation here or there. So the third video is over and just to bring you back in terms of comparison to the beginning, I would like to refresh your memory on the first video, just for comparison purposes. So in this video, just to recap, see something happening here, there, here, over here. Well, I hope you have a clear picture of the three options. You can uh, later on provide us the results, provide me with the results of those, that homework. And the homework is done, uh, given in the end, in a um, joint view with all of the additional homeworks that will be uh, given to you during the different sessions of this practical course. So before I say goodbye, I have one more task. And this uh, is a short reminder of our stream overview. Just to recapitulate with you, you got now a short introduction to this practical course. So what the methods are, what cell line you will be using, and also the inhibitors. And now you will have a session with, Professor, with Ilya to learn about cell culture and the cell culture protocol. And this ends up the practical course for the day. Tomorrow, tomorrow we will have, uh, you will have an introduction to immunofluorescence part, so transfection and immunofluorescence protocol, also from Ilya, that will be followed on the following day on Wednesday by the subcellular fractionation with Taras. This subcellular fractionation protocol is then split into two parts and will follow you with the different methods, also including the SDS page and Western blotting on Thursday. And I will see you back again here on Friday for our last session. Uh, please, if there are any questions or any comments from your side, just write on the chat. I'm always uh, available for any questions you might have. We will now do a 15 minutes break and we are back exactly at 2 p.m. so that Professor Ilya Vieto can introduce you to the cell culture protocol. See you on Friday. And again, as I said, if there are any questions, please just provide them via chat. Thank you. Yeah, yeah.
20 ein richtiges Duda, aber mach die Rechnung nicht ohne Hest, heiß und Huber. Online-Vorlesung geht ab, ziemlich nice. Um 11 Uhr stehen wir alle bereit. Transportiert wird der Weib ohne Spannungsgradienten. Huber, Hest und Heiß, die Unwissenheit wird enden. Sag mir, wer liefert ab? Heißer als ein Rio. Das Zöll, Rio, Rio. Wir sitzen alle da. Sind am Ende mit uns vom Land zu sehen. Es kann doch alles nicht sein. Aber wir sind niemals allein. Come on, everybody!
Good evening and welcome to more songs for cynical scientists. <laughs> I'd like to take this opportunity of telling you what's been happening in the lab since I last addressed you. <laughs> First slide, please. Now I'm sure you'll all remember what I said here last November when I said what I had discovered with such ease. First slide, please, for the sake of time reduction, I'll miss out the introduction and go straight into the details. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. This shows NMR 3D of MPF and TBP. We PCR'd P53 and I beat cyclins A to Z, as you can see. Next slide, please. Can you hear me at the back? Well, can you hear me at the back? Oh, now the microphone's got feedback. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Please can someone shut that door or stop the rock group in next door? And please can someone kindly catch that swarm of bees? Next slide, please. I'm sure you can't make out the tracks cause this has just come in by fax. I'm still expecting several more, so next slide, please. Next slide, please. Now this curve that goes straight down shows stimulation upside down or just a crack the wrong way round. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> next slide, please. Can you go 13 slides back? Or is it 16? I lose track. And no, I meant the left projector. Next slide, please. <laughs> Next slide, please. Now this is looking rather blurred. Is it a plane or just a bird? I should have skipped that seventh whiskey. Next slide, please. <laughs> Next slide, please. This may cause some slight confusion because it shows cold nuclear fusion. Now it's melting the projector. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Have I been drinking too much liquor? Or is that smoke there getting thicker? Can you find a new projector? Next slide, please. Next slide, please. It looks as if I'll have to shout. The fire alarm is winning out. Can you just try to pay attention? Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I don't think this slide can be seen. That fireman's hat obscures the screen. Can you just wait until I've finished? Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Now I'm feeling rather manic, but the audience's panic won't disturb my concentration. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Now this looks like apoptosis. Can you turn off those fire hoses? Cause the water level's rising. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I'd like to thank the organizers, those two penny-pinching misers. <laughs> Who would only guarantee my one-way fare? <laughs> Last slide, please. I see the fireman's going frantic, so I'd best swim the Atlantic in despair. This is a nightmare experienced by most scientists. As I was walking one summer's morning, I made my way to the library. Und 
Welcome everybody to the second part of today's practical course. My name is Ilya Vieto, so you know probably my name. Unfortunately, we didn't meet so far. The reason I'm saying unfortunately is that this uh, cell biology practical course is the continuation of the cell culture course, which was given by me. And you have seen the theory. You have seen also many nice videos made by companies but you are missing the practical part of this course which would be the handling of cells so hands-on work where you would learn the crucial part of the preparatory events for this first and following experiments so as you can see here uh, it's called cell biology practical course and first part is the work with cell, cell culture HeLa cells and then we are going to the first experiment, which is mainly focused on immunofluorescent detection of certain organelles within these HeLa cells. In order to visualize them, you will see how one can transfect DNA into HeLa cells. Then comes the next step, which is the subculturing protocol of these transfected cells on so-called cover slips. And the last step is the immunofluorescence preparation of samples for the analysis. So today we'll go through the first part, which is the general work with HeLa cells and also this culturing, splitting of HeLa cells. On the first picture, we are going back to the theory. So you have heard already something about the history of this cell line. What I have prepared for you here are two crucial images. They are coming from the catalog of the company, which is called ATCC, which stands for American Tissue Culture Collection. Why I'm mentioning that is that if you work with cell cultures, with cells, and you want to have publishable data, you have to have material which is reproducible, which has the proper quality. And the source where you can get such material is this ATCC. Then the second reason why I'm show showing these pictures is that on the left side you can see so-called low density cell culture and on the right side high density. Why I'm mentioning that? It is necessary to get a feeling for the growth of cells in order to be able to produce data which are of publishable quality, that means reproducible experiments, and that starts with the proper cell density. So on the left side you see many areas where are no cells, then you see confluent parts of the culture, and then you see also something what corresponds to the mitotic image. On the right side is much more dense uh, culture, and the reason why I'm showing that is that we will get to the next step, which is the transfection, and the transfection of cells really depends on the cell density. So you will have to be able to recognize when the culture is too dense and is not good, appropriately prepared for transfection. More accurate techniques are counting of cells, which I will show you as well. Then what you should notice on these images, on the bottom of the image are so-called scale bars. And these are important for all publications. Always in the image you have to introduce this scale bar and there you can recognize the size of these cells because this scale bar is 100 micrometers. So you can immediately see that these cells are smaller than 100 micrometers and in this region are probably two to three cells. So you will see what is the size of HeLa cells. Uh, some historical issue to this story of HeLa cells. So this lady was of Afro-American origin and it happened in 50s. 50th uh, of last century, so the political situation was different. And uh, during the last years, the situation changed rapidly and uh, John Hopkins University, where this first cell culture was initiated, was generated, was so generous that they started uh, contact with the family of Henrietta Lacks. And nowadays there are symposia, there are also stipends donated by John Hopkins University and the great-grandchildren study for free at this university. 
And another reason why you have to have a look on this culture is that what needs such a culture. So we are coming to the next uh, slide, which comes actually from the protocol. And this protocol you can download from Ilias, as already mentioned last week by Professor Huber. You can have a look on all techniques and steps which are used in these techniques and follow it. We are starting with the page number two. And then we are coming to the next issue, which is the recommended medium. So the medium abbreviation is called DMEM. DMEM stands for Dulbeckos Modified Ego Medium. And uh, the composition of this media is all around the world the same. But it is very important to notice what is the actual concentration of components in this medium, which you will find in the practice. Uh, catalog of company where you can buy this media. So what would, do we have in this medium? There are non-essential amino acids, vitamins, L-glutamine, high glucose, phenol red, and so on and so forth. Now I would like to test how many people are following online. So please, if you are online, use the chat function and try to write down what is your idea why in a medium for cell culture we use phenol red. So I will go on and I will explain you the rest of the composition of this medium, but those of you who know the answer, please write it on the chat. So non-essential amino acids, that's clear. Vitamins is, is clear as well. L-glutamine and high glucose are sources of energy for the cells. And as you have seen, these tumor cell line HeLa, they are growing very fast and they form a confluent uh, monolayer first. So they need a lot of energy. That's the reason why this medium contains high glucose. Then it contains also 10% FBS. FBS, the abbreviation states, stands for fetal bovine serum. It is important to notice what you use. So it's either fetal bovine serum or the fetal calf serum. That's the same, but it is not calf serum. So you have to be careful. Why? Because this is a source of growth reagents which are necessary for the growth of the cell. So growth factors are in this serum. The next practical remark, since this is a practical course, is that you have to test each batch of such a serum in your particular cell line. And if you have a good one, then you order from the company a larger stock and you use it all the time, the same uh, batch of serum. The last component is the mixture of 1% penicillin and streptomycin. These are antibiotics which are necessary for the cell culture. Why it is mentioned here? Because the presence of uh, this Antibiotics affect the efficiency of certain procedures, as for instance, transfection. So that technique which we will use is not affected by them, but many others are affected. So you have to be very careful if you have it in the medium or not. And the exact concentration of these antibiotics is mentioned here on the bottom of the page. There are certainly other types of uh, antibiotics as, for instance, gencyclovir and so on, but these are not commonly used in cell cultures, only in e exceptional cases when you get some contamination. But my advice is, uh, advice is not to use them because once cells are treated with some other antibiotics, then they are all, almost all the time changed and they don't correspond to the original phenotype. So if you have the chance, don't use such cells. So we get already first answers by students in the chat and who say that probably for staining of the cells. So that's, that's not the accurate and correct uh, answer. As a pH indicator, that's the correct response. This is what we wanted to see. Maybe as an indicator of what is not clear, Note these changes in pH levels is once again the correct answer. pH indicator, pH indicator, that's correct. So this pH indicator is important because that pH of the medium corresponds to the density of the cells. So if the culture is overgrown or is very dense, then the pH will be probably in which range? Can you also answer my question and we'll see what is your response? 
Now we are coming to the next picture, which is also from the original protocol book, which you will find on page number three. And this is the plan of the experiment. So each student was planned to be provided with one 10 centimeter dish of HeLa cells. Uh, the question is, how many cells do we have on a 10 centimeter dish? So HeLa cells are uh, cancer cell line, they grow very fast, and if they are completely confluent on such a dish, you can have up to 8 million cells. And from this one dish, we plan to prepare several plates with different numbers of cells for different experiments. So the very first one is a so-called six-well dish, where the plan was or is to use 500,000 cells per well. And this experiment is, this plate is ready for the experiment number one, which is the immunofluorescence detection of subcellular localization of marker proteins for organelles, where we would do in the second step the transfection. Next one is a simple 10 centimeter dish used for the next experiment number two, which is the subsoil fractionation, where we need a lot of cells because it's a biochemical technique where you need a lot of starting material. So two million cells in this case. The next one is a 96 well dish where is planned to be done the experiment, which is, has the abbreviation WSD, which is water soluble tetrazoleum salt and it's a proliferation experiment where we need 5 times 10 to the third so 5000 cells per one well and the last experiment are three six well dishes where you will follow the proliferation using different cell counting techniques and there the number of cells is 80000 cells per well so this is just for your information what would be done or what we plan to do also maybe in September in practical course. Basically from one cell dish you can prepare many different ones always with a exact number of cells. Why I'm mentioning that? Because this is very important for any experiment. If you want to have reproducible data you have to count the number of cells which you are going to use and then you can have every time more or less reproducible results. So here is once again the summary of these plates which were planned to be used and parts of them was normally done by students, some of it was prepared by our technician. Why? Because this uh, procedure is rather time consuming and if you are doing it for the very first time in your career then you need a lot of time to learn how to do the proper handling. So we have here another answer, overgrown cultures become acidic, so the pH drops somewhere below 7, that's the correct answer. And then the next question is, what is the color of the medium if the pH drops, so how would you recognize it? Now, going to the practical part of the experiment, what we are going to do and what you will see in the movie which we have prepared for you are uh, all these steps as mentioned in the protocol book on the page number four which is the preparation of cells for the experiment number one immunofluorescence and there will come few more control questions so the first step in the procedure is to aspirate culture medium from the 10 cm dish, which you will get. And these cells in the culture dish are confluent, that's very important. How we'll recognize it, I will show you right away. Then briefly rinse the cells with 10 ml of pre-warmed phosphate buffered saline, so we call it PBS buffer. And important it is that it is pre-warmed to 37 degrees. Then the next step is adding of trypsin EDTA solution to the cell culture dish. So we want to trypsinize the cells. Now the question is, why do you think we have to wash cells with PBS before we will add the trypsin? 
So we have already few answers. It turns yellow from red to orange yellow. This is the correct answer. So if the pH is below 7, so acidic medium is yellowish. Now, the next question was, why do we have to wash cells with PBS before we add strepsin? Okay, we will wait for the answer, but what is the next step? We have to wait until cells will detach from the plate, and we do that by incubating them at 37 degrees. Here a small detail, we are working in this experiment with HeLa cells, so they are relatively easily trypsinized with 1x trypsin solution. If you have a different cell culture, as for instance epithelial cells, there you have to use higher concentration of trypsin, so what usually we do, we wash cells with PBS, then apply 1x trypsin and afterwards 10x trypsin. And related to that is my next question, and that is, why do you think we have also EDTA? So it's not only trypsin, but it's combination of trypsin with EDTA. And if you have time, you can ask, uh, answer this question also in the chat. Okay, so that will be later. But basically I told you that you aspirate the medium, you wash cells with PBS, then you add trypsin, then you put cells into the incubator at 37 degrees, and afterwards you observe cells under inverted microscope if they are already trypsinized. So this is important, and important is also to notice that this should happen within five minutes. So you have to be careful because you don't want to over trypsinize cells. You want to uh, detach cells from the surface of the plate, but you don't want to open the cells. And the answer here is maybe trypsin would react with the medium otherwise. Well, that's not exact answer. We are still waiting for the correct answer. 8, eight milliliters of complete growth medium and resuspend the cells by gently pipetting up and down. Here in this step number six we are coming to the same question as we had after step number one, which was washing with BBS. So there is a connection between these two steps. Why do we have to add complete growth medium? I explained to you what is complete. Complete means that in the medium you have FBS or FCS and antibiotics. Why do we have to add this to cells in trypsin? And resuspend, that's clear that we want to have individual cells and not clumps. And then you transfer them into 15 milliliter falcon tube. Now we are coming to the next step. You have to centrifuge this. Why do we do that? Because you want to get rid of this trypsin. And therefore you have to <coughs> uh, centrifuge cells in a centrifuge. In this case, it's not very scientific because what is scientific in the publication, you have always to write how many G's you use. In this case, it's written solver links, the type of centrifuge. Important is the fact that you don't exceed 1000 rotations per minute. It's five minutes and at room temperature, wide room temperature, you don't need to cool down the centrifuge since these are living cells. Why not more than 1000 RPM? Because you don't want to break cells and kill them. In the meantime, you should prepare medium in the new six-well dish, which is labeled here according to the procedure which will follow this step, and that is the transfection. The first well will not be transfected, the next one is transfected with RAP5 DNA, and the next one with RAP7 DNA. Why to prepare three milliliters of the medium? First of all, you want to have the same dilution, same volume of medium in each well. Secondly, if you use very small amounts of cells, you don't want to put them on a dry dish, but you want to mix them immediately with the growth medium, so you prepare this first. After centrifugation, you have to first aspirate the medium containing trypsin, so this is important. This is the proper way how to handle cells. The other option would be that you 
uh, use so-called dry trypsinization. We are not doing that in our practical course. We use this protocol. So you aspirate the medium containing trypsin. Afterwards, you resuspend cells in exactly 10 milliliters of medium. Why? Because you need to count the cells. So you need to have always the exact volume of the medium where you have your cells. The next step is counting cells. I will show you in the video how we do it using one option, one nice instrument with relatively very accurate result. And the last step is to add exactly 500,000 cells per well in this six well dish. This is also important because you need to have reproducible data. Cells usually grow in a different speed, so you need to know how many cells to use on the day before you do the transfection. Why? I will show you later tomorrow. And then the next step is to resuspend these cells in the medium. So we want to have a homogeneous suspension. Afterwards, you incubate them in the incubator with the constant temperature 37 degrees, 5% CO2 and humidity. So we have here a few more answers. Uh, one is that maybe it can remove dead cells from the plate and also many media contain serum which inactivates trypsin. So the second part of this answer is the correct answer. This is what I wanted to hear. So the answer is that if you add, add your complete medium containing also serum, then you inactivate the activity of trypsin. Why? Because there are anti-trypsin inhibitors in this medium containing serum. Uh, PBS is pH buffer, yeah, is also buffering, that's correct. But basically we want to get rid of the full medium before we add trypsin. When cells are washed with PBS beforehand because the media for the cell culture contains FBS, correct. FBS contains protease inhibitors and stop trypsin protease. And why EDTA is once again repeated question by Professor Huber. So please ask, uh, answer also this question. In the meantime, I will proceed to the video. So now, don't leave the computer. This is the most important part of today's presentation. We tried to uh, video record all steps. Uh, this is just an example. So this is not really the accurate protocol from uh, your protocol book. But the, there are the most important steps which you need for any trypsinization and preparing of cells for experiments. So if we start here, the very first message which I have written on the bottom is clean everything with 75% ethanol. What means everything? So you have first of all to clean your hands uh, where, where you use gloves, but you have to clean also the working surface in the lamina flow, how it works and so on, you have heard or you have seen on the videos which I have presented in the cell culture course. And here you can see a small detail which is also important only because this movie, when we wanted to make a close-up and to show you some details, we moved this front side glass uh, side higher. But normally when you work in the cell culture hood, you have to have it at the proper height, which is somewhere here, because otherwise it's not functional. So, starting with this movie here, you can see that we have prepared their different sizes of gloves. You always use them because these are human cells, and on one hand you can contaminate your cell culture, on the other, theoretically, but you can also contaminate yourself. Now, be careful, because here comes the next question. Why do we use 75% alcohol and not 100% alcohol? Try to answer this question and write it in the chat. So I see here is already an answer. EDTA activates trypsin. No, that's not correct. EDTA is a metal chelator. It detaches ions. Trypsin is now able to work better. That is uh, partially correct. But the main idea is that EDT is a chelator, so calcium, magnesium from your medium will be chelated and that helps to detach cells from the surface of the Petri dish. 
So you are not only trypsinizing cells by <coughs> uh, disrupting interactions between cells themselves, but also between cells and the surface of the plate. And for that, you need the EDTA. So don't forget the next question is the 75% ethanol. Why 75 and not 100? And we'll come to that later. Now, after this step, which is really important, you take cells out from the incubator. So the incubator, as I said, has 37 degrees, 5% CO2, 97% water humidity. On the bottom of this incubator, you can see a metal tray. And in this metal tray, here is water. It is also necessary to check it out because you don't want to dry out your cells. Now, label dishes properly. What means that many people work in the same lab, put their cells into the same incubator and therefore in order to recognize your own cells, you have to put on the dish always the name of the cell line, the passage number, your initials and the date when you have split these cells. This is a small but important fact. Then comes the next step, which is very, very important, and that is that you have to check always, every single time, your cells under the inverted microscope. So in this case, in this microscope, the source of light is on the bottom, then comes objective, then you have your sample, then is the camera, and here is the image, which we try to record. So what one can see here, first of all, when you move the plate, you see immediately if there are floating cells, which would be dead cells, and that's a bad sign. Or if you have their nicely adherent cells. The next point is if they are confluent, overconfluent, and so on. But the very first thing which one can see is if the whole culture is contaminated or not. Because if it would be contaminated, uh, usually bacteria are moving very rapidly through the medium and you would see something what is roundish or small sticks running around. The medium would be turbid, milky and not clear as this one. The next thing which you can see here are these few rounded up cells. So these are not adherent cells anymore. If you shake the plate you will see that they are moving around. But this is not a bad sign. This is normal, this number of cells. Then the next thing which you can see is an area where they are confluent. And here you see post-mitotic cells. Then what you can see here in this area is a space not covered by cells, but cells which are looking for the neighbors. So people, uh, these cells, they like contact. And therefore, they make protrusions and they are searching for neighboring cells. And you can see nicely these protrusions here. And by working with cells, after a certain time, you can already predict that this is probably 70 to 80% confluent plate, which is important step for the transfection or fact for the transfection. You have to have cells which are approximately 70 to 80% confluent. So we have a few more answers here. Because if you use 100% alcohol, then it immediately denatures the proteins of the bacteria at the very surface, thereby creating sort of a protective layer. That's the exact answer. This is very correct. 100% ethanol coagulates the proteins instantly by building a, a protein layer, which protects other proteins. The microbes are uh, in dormant stage. 75% ethanol penetrates slower. Yeah, because it's not evaporating so fast would work fast, a layer of that material would protect the material exactly. So this is nice that you know it already and you know how to work properly. So the next step in the protocol was to use the PBS trypsin. We have to be careful, they have to be warmed up to 37 degrees. That's the reason why I'm showing you this water bath here, because we are working with uh, living cells, you don't want to shock them. And what you see here is 1x PBS and 1x trypsin, so be careful, everything has to be properly labeled, don't use a concentrated PBS or trypsin. The next step is clean vessels with ethanol from top to bottom. Why from top to bottom? Because they were standing in this water bath, so on the bottom is theoretically maybe something like contamination, 
it should not be because you have probably noticed that the water was bluish. That means that there is a special detergent in the water bath and it should not be contaminated. Still, you go from the top to the bottom, you clean your vessels and then we go to the next step, which is in the tissue culture hood, in the flamina flow. It has to be properly organized. This is a small detail which is also shown on these professional videos that you have to have things always left and right in a way that you don't go with your arms above an open petri dish. So you don't contaminate anything by dropping uh, pieces of uh, dirt. Then you have to open the tubes, prepare for pipetting because you will have only one hand free. Then what we use is to aspirate media is the vacuum pump and this vacuum pump is clean but still in order to protect your cells not to contaminate anything you have to use a fresh sterile tip. So these yellow tips for the pipettes are already autoclaved. You take one of them and then move it away, no, don't handle anything above these yellow tips, then it's important, small detail, that there is this plug, you turn it on and off, and be careful where you suck away the medium, so don't go directly on the surface of the plate, because you would uh, destroy uh, sensitive cells, but you always have to go to the border and to the wall, and you aspirate media there. Next step, after you got rid of this medium is that you wash cells with the PBS. So PBS is pre-warmed and then you will see that we use these disposable pipettes. It's a small but important thing because we had this problem before. Some of you had never ever pipetted anything in the lab so you open carefully this part of the pipette and be very careful never touch anything with the tip of the pipette. This can happen if you are under stress, you are working quickly. In that case you have to immediately discard such a pipette and take a fresh one, otherwise you would contaminate your cells. Even if the surface is cleaned with ethanol, even if your hands are clean, it can always happen. So always be careful and tip should not touch anything. Then we use in the lab this pipette aid, so you have to turn the pipette, push it into this pipette aid with the labeling towards you so that you can accurately see the volumes you want to use. And this pipette aid has two knobs, so the upper one is to pull in the liquid and the other bottom one is to push out the liquid from the pipette. Then comes this washing step. Here is important that you know when it's necessary to measure something accurately and when not. So in this case it is not important if it's 10 milliliters or less or more, but important is to wash all your cells. Once again be careful, don't pipette directly on the cells, go on the side wall and thereby you will not detach the cells, but you have to swirl it properly in order to get rid of the whole medium on the surface of this plate from the cells. Then one small detail is shown here. Everything what was somehow in contact with living cells, that means medium, in this case PBS and so on, has to be discarded in a safe way. So all solid waste, in this case the pipette, go into this biohazard waste which will be autoclaved and only afterwards discarded. Everything what is liquid we aspirate with this vacuum pump where it is mixed in the, with the special detergent and discarded after autoclaving afterwards. So this is an important fact. You have to be careful when you work in the lab and not uh, throw everything into the same trash. So the next step is aspirating PBS. Small detail, you have seen also in the professional videos the lid has to be upside down. The reason is that the, the air here went through the filter in the lamina flow and therefore it's safe. 
it's safer than the surface of your lamina flow. Then you aspirate PBS, you do it also on the side. Everything because you don't want to dilute trypsin. Cells should not dry out, that's the reason why you have to work quickly. Then you have to know how much trypsin you use. It is not really important volume, but important is to repeat the same volume for all your samples because you need to balance it afterwards during the centrifugation. And it is important that the whole surface of the plate is covered with this trypsin solution. So it's in this case 1x trypsin. In this case, you can pipette directly on the cells because you want to detach them, you don't want to keep them adherent. Then you spread it all around the surface of the plate on all cells. So there should be no dry area. And then you put it into the incubator, which is 37 degrees, 5% CO2. Humidity, as I said, is 97%. Then you check time because you don't want to over trypsinize it. So, three to five minutes. In the meantime, you take out from the water bath the pre-warmed uh, medium. And what you can see here, it's the DMEM high glucose. Here are the components of the medium. And then the initials of the user, Tara Stasic. And then this stands for plus plus. And plus plus is complete medium. That means that we have 10% FCS and penstrap in this medium. You clean it with the ethanol and then comes the next step. Five minutes are over, so you take cells from the incubator where they should have been trypsinized properly. And that means that the next step must be what? You have to check it under the microscope if they are really trypsinized if they are still adherent or not. So you want to get all cells, they must be floating. So how can we recognize that? If previously you have seen that these cells were flat, sitting on the surface of the plate, and now you have these rounded up cells, sometimes in such chunks, sometimes not. And when you move the plate, they are floating. So here we have one or two cells which are not floating, but the majority is not adherent anymore. Then we have to stop the trypsinization by adding, uh, adding medium with FCS. So you know already what is the function of FCS. You add the trypsin inhibitor in order not to over trypsinize cells. In this case, you have to be careful how much you add because you have to have at the very end 10 milliliters in all your samples. So the total volume is 10 milliliters. We had there uh, one or two milliliters of trypsin, so we have to add now medium, wash down all cells from the surface, collect them on the bottom. And uh, in this case, we have plenty of cells, but if you want to be really careful, you repeat this step several times. Close properly and mainly label properly this tube because now we have only one single sample. But if you have several different samples, you need to know what is what. So don't forget to label it properly. Then we go to the centrifuge. It has to be balanced. As I told you, five minutes, 1000 RPM at room temperature. So you have to adjust everything. This is an important step because if you use too high speed, you will damage your cells. So now five minutes centrifugation and afterwards you should see a pellet on the bottom of this tube. You will see that nicely afterwards when I will aspirate the medium. So here is the pellet and that gives you certain information if you use different types of cells, <clears throat> transfected cells and so on, you see if they grow evenly or not, if you have larger, smaller pellets, if you have enough step cells for the next step. So first is to aspirate this medium containing trypsin. 
in this case you can also tilt the tube you will not lose the pellet but you have to be careful and now you can nicely see the pellet of cells and this was the medium so if a little bit remains there nothing happens because we will dilute it with the next medium coming afterwards so this is the pellet and the next step is to resuspend the pellet and resuspend it exactly in 10 milliliters. Why exactly 10 milliliters? Because you want to count the number of cells, so you need to know in which volume you have your cells. If the pellet is huge, then you have to use a little bit less of media, but that you will see nicely in the tube, because it's calibrated tube, so up to 10 milliliters. The next step is resuspend. Resuspend means that we pipe it up and down. You have to be careful not to make bubbles because these bubbles will not be healthy for the cells. They are killing cells, so you have to know how to handle this pipette aid. You also need to watch the upper part of the pipette not to suck in the medium into the filter, which would destroy the pipette aid. Now don't forget that you have to put this into the biohazard waste and after that we are going to counting of cells. So for this purpose I will show you one procedure where you need a small epi. You add into this Eppendorf tube 10 microliters of Tripan Blue. So now comes another question. Who knows what is Tripan Blue good for? And We'll go to the next step. So 10 microliters of this Tripan Blue will be prepared for each sample separately in an Eppendorf tube. And we will add 10 microliters of our cell suspension. For that purpose you need first of all to mix it because you want to have a representative sample. Then you take these 10 microliters and pipette it to the 10 microliter of, uh, microliters of Tripan Blue. Mix it properly and then take out from these 20 microliters 10 microliters and Put this on something what is called cell counting slide. So you will see the detail afterwards. Luna is the mark. This is not important, but it's a slide. It's like microscopy slide where you have one one. You can measure two samples with each of these slides. You add your sample here. You fill it completely with these 10 microliters, and then we proceed with it to the counter which is here, so I'm not going to do any advertisement for this particular product, but it's a practical one, <laughs> which is based on the image analysis. And we use bright field cell counting. Why image analysis, you will see immediately. So we put this sample into the instrument, and then you see the same way as with the microscope, your sample, you have to look for cells, so you can move the image until you find enough cells. In this case, there was very low number of cells. That's the reason why we see here only one, two, three, maybe this is probably debris. These are intact cells. In order to focus properly, you have to enlarge the zoom to 4x and then focus properly. You see, should see such a ring, which is the cell. And then you start the counting. And at the end of the counting, you will get a result, which is uh, the major advantage of this device. Since you see that we have in this sample 2.36 times 10 to the fifth cells in one milliliter sample. However, from these are only 1.75 times 10 to the fifth cells live. And we have also dead cells. So the viability is interesting fact uh, which we have learned from this counting is 74% are live cells. Then average size, 
which is linked to the previous information which you have seen on the uh, picture which I showed you of HeLa cells. So the average size of our HeLa cells here is 17 micrometers, total number of cells which were measured. And the reason why I'm showing that is that for the future experiment we need only live cells naturally, not dead cells. So this information is the important one. 1.75 times 10 to the fifth is in one milliliter. And we have 10 milliliters, so the next step is to calculate how much, what will be the volume which we'll use for the next experiment. Here are the answers coming, so what is written here? Trip and blue can stain dead or damaged cells, while healthy cells don't get stained. This way you can see whether the membranes of many cells have been damaged or not. Yes, this is the correct answer. Trip and blue is used to distinguish between living and dead cells. Dead cells that incorporated while living don't. Trip and blue stains. Okay, so obviously you know how to use trip and blue. And as I said, this instrument is based on image analysis. So those cells which are not dead will be uh, labeled only on the surface. And you can focus, but they will not have blue cytoplasm. That's the reason why this instrument can recognize between living and dead cells. So, this is our protocol book. Sorry, I was slow. And this is my calculation. So, what we have from this measurement, the result was 1.75 times 10 to the fifth living cells in one milliliter, what we need is 500,000 cells in one well that corresponds to 2.8 milliliters from this 10 milliliter in our falcon tube. So the next step which you will see is that you have to clean your hands with ethanol, then you have to prepare the next dish which is in this case a six well dish that will be for the transfection. Then the, every dish has upper left corner cut. It is important for orientation. And then you have to label it properly. So to know what will come where. HeLa cells, passage number, which is missing here. Date when it was prepared, your initials. And then for this particular experiment, you will write un untransfected, transfected with RAP5, transfected with RAP7. You take a fresh pipette. You have to see on the calibration, then you have to resuspend the cells in your 50 milliliter falcon tube and be careful, don't suck it in to the filter and don't make any bubbles. And then the next step is to use the 2.8 milliliters per well. So in the protocol is written 3 milliliters and then add cells, but in this case we had very a uh, low number of cells and that is the reason why we didn't need to prepare medium and add afterwards because we had to add 2.8 milliliters per well. So this is the second well, then exactly the same for the last one. And afterwards, you close the dish, spread it evenly. This is important because if you rotate the plate, then you will have cells only at the rim of the well and not in the center. You want to have it evenly spread, so you have to do this number eight, big eight uh, movement and spread it evenly. Then you put it into the incubator and you Close the door gently. Don't smash the door. It is a small remark, but an important one, because if you do that, the whole uh, incubator will shake a little bit, and then you will not have cells uh, evenly spread around the whole plate, but you will have it only at the edge of each well. So that was basically it. This was the first part of the practical course. 
And if you have any questions, please ask in your chat section. So I have asked you several questions. You have answered correctly. We have here something more about rip and blue is used for cell counting. You can check on cell viability and so on. So I hope that everything was clear. And as we said last week, the advantage of this course compared to the classical one is that you could have a close look on each step. You could see things which usually 29 students don't see above the shoulder of the person who is demonstrating these steps. So I hope that you enjoyed it and you will join us tomorrow. And we will stay online for additional 10 to 15 minutes. See if you, if you have any questions, free. So feel free to ask us or you can send also emails afterwards. Thank you for your uh, attention. Good evening and welcome to more songs for cynical scientists. I'd like to take this opportunity of telling you what's been happening in the lab since I last addressed you. First slide, please. Now I'm sure you'll all remember what I said here last November when I said what I had discovered with such ease. First slide, please, for the sake of time reduction, I'll miss out the introduction and go straight into the details. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. This shows NMR 3D of MPF and TBP. We PCR'd P53 and I peaked cyclins A to Z, as you can see. Next slide, please. Can you hear me at the back? Well, can you hear me at the back? Oh, now the microphone's got feedback. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Please, can someone shut that door or stop the rock group in next door? And please, can someone kindly catch that swarm of bees? Next slide, please. I'm sure you can't make out the tracks, cause this has just come in by fax. I'm still expecting several more, so next slide, please. Next slide, please. Now this curve that goes straight down shows stimulation upside down or just a crack the wrong way round. I'm not quite sure. Next slide, please. Can you go 13 slides back? Or is it 16? I lose track. And no, I meant the left projector. Next slide, please. <laughs> Next slide, please. Now this is looking rather blurred. Is it a plane or just a bird? I should have skipped that seventh whiskey. Next slide, please. <laughs> Next slide, please. This may cause some slight confusion, because it shows cold nuclear fusion. Now it's melting the projector. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Have I been drinking too much liquor, or is that smoke there getting thicker? Can you find a new projector? Next slide, please. Next slide, please. It looks as if I'll have to shout. The fire alarm is winning out. Can you just try to pay attention? Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I don't think this slide can be seen. That fireman's hat obscures the screen. Can you just wait until I've finished? Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Now I'm feeling rather manic, but the audience is panic. Won't disturb my concentration. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Now this looks like apoptosis. Can you turn off those fire hoses? Cause the water level's rising. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I'd like to thank the organizers, those two penny-pinching misers. <laughs> who would only guarantee my one-way fare. <laughs>
Last slide, please. I see the fireman's going frantic, so I'd best swim the Atlantic in despair. <laughs> this is a nightmare experienced by most scientists. As I was walking one summer's morning I made my way to the library In search of wisdom and education I scanned the journal so eagerly I picked up nature and looked inside it And lots of adverts I there did see For PCR and restriction enzymes For cloning kids and HPLC At last I tracked down the page of contents And scanned the title so eagerly There were quarks and quasars and plate tectonics <laughs> T-cell receptors and HIV And as I browsed through the latest scandals, I sighed and yawned rather wearily, till there I saw my latest paper, and brightened up most immediately. I swelled with pride as I gazed upon it. What finer gels could you ever see? <laughs> and every figure was as we'd planned it. Models of logic and clarity. But then I paused in deep contemplation A nagging doubt stirred to trouble me It was just three days since we'd sent the paper <laughs> There was no way this could be by me The author's name and address were different <laughs> All other features were just the same <laughs> I gazed in horror at every figure There was no doubt we were scooped again I muttered oaths as I gazed upon it. I mopped the sweat from my fevered head. I'd have torn my hair, but that posed a problem. <laughs> so I sighed and wished that I'd stayed in bed. I found a keyboard and started writing A short erratum I sent straightway Correcting names and address of authors <laughs> And whistling softly I strolled away
That described one familiar sort of scientific 